So my name is Alan Wolf. I started learning C++ in high school because I wanted to make video games and I'm working as a senior software engineer at Medtronic. I also enjoy to experiment and try new things in C++. One of the reasons I'm able to do it is thanks to the openness of the C++ community, both online and offline, which I truly appreciate. It is relevant because today we are going to dive into the world of compile time parsers by looking at open source libraries. Um, even though uh, we will cover things from the perspective of compile time parsers, um, many of the implementation techniques and design decisions can be applied to other areas. So expressive code is code that uh, communicates its purpose in a way that is easy to read and write. And it has on two things, the syntax and naming. In this talk, we will focus more on the syntax part. Um, here we have uh, two examples of code that creates a vector with four integers. Um, as the language evolves, we get more features that help us write more expressive code. And in the C++11 example, the code uh, is uh, easier to read and has less boilerplate. Uh, we can also use operator overloads to call a costume function for specific types, and this way to make our code more expressive. Uh, in this example, the divide operator is a good choice because it is often used to write file paths in operating systems. Also, because the operator is left associative, we can chain multiple uh, strings to a path. Domain-specific language, or DSL, is a language that is designed to help uh, domain experts solve problems in uh, their specific domain. And it does it by fitting the uh, vocabulary and syntax uh, to this domain. So the um, trade-off of using a DSL is at first you need to understand the domain and then you need to learn the syntax of the DSL. But once you do it, it can be a, a powerful tool for solving, for solving problems in that domain. Here we have an example of a DSL from the Boost Spirit library, which is a library for, rant for writing runtime parsers. This example code is part of an implementation of an XML parser. As you can see, we can make C++ look almost like a completely different language. But there are still limitations. The syntax must be a valid C++ syntax because it needs to be compiled by the compi compiler. For example, if we look at part of the code from the previous slide, uh, we can write star node, but if we wanted to write node star, we will get a compilation error that says that the unary star operator must be on the left side of the expression. Let's do a quick recap with a filter transform example. Here we have a vector of cats and code that returns the IDs and names of all the cats over the age of 42. One way we can make our code more expressive is to use range-based for loop. But this is 2023 and we have ranges now. So we, now the body of the function literally says filter transform and we can change the operations by using the pipe operator. Also, we don't need to declare the type of the result vector anymore. But what if we wanted to do something like this, right in an SQL style syntax? Um, now our code is just a single line that clearly expresses its purpose. Um, let's try to understand what's going on here. So we have a string with some costume syntax, and then we have this underscore from, which is a call to a literal operator, and it uh, transforms the string into a callable object that uh, when we invoke it, returns us the vector with the IDs and strings. Let's generalize it. So in the specific case, we had an SQL-like syntax that was transformed into some sort of lambda. The general case for compile time parsers is that we can have any arbitrary syntax and convert it, convert it into any compile time value. Now, is, you might ask yourself, is something like this even possible? Well, spoiler alert, the answer is yes, and by the end of the talk you will know how, but we need to start from the beginning, which in my case was a Google search. So I tried to search, did anyone try to do this crazy thing in C++? And the answer was, of course, there is already a boost library for it. In hindsight, I should have probably expected this. 
And this leads us to the first library of today, Boost Metaparse is a compile time parsing library by Abel Sinkovic. The library uses C++ 98 for everything, except for creating the compile time strings. So in C++ 98, we have to write each character separated by a comma. And in C++ 11, we can use the, the boost metaparse string macro. Um, the library uses template structs, which are uh, sometimes called meta functions. And this is what a typical uh, parser looks like. So we have this struct called costume parser, and uh, as that you can think of it like a class, and you can think of the inner uh, apply struct as a method that takes the string and the correct uh, input position. The syntax of using a template struct is not very clear. It is different than the syntax that we are used to, and we have a lot of uh, nested angle brackets. Boost MetaParse also allows us to write parsers that transform our syntax into a runtime function or a compile time function. Another interesting uh, feature of Boost MetaParse is that we create meta function with an Haskell-like syntax. So here the MetaHS type is a compile time map that acts like a symbol table. The import uh, call adds a symbol to the map. The define call uh, creates a function from a Haskell-like syntax, and that is to the map. Each of the calls returns the type of the new modified map, so we can nicely change them together. In the end, we can get the functions from the map and use them in C++. We can also create grammar from uh, grammar rules uh, like this. Notice here at the bottom, that we have a plus expression that uses a prod expression in its body, but the prod expression is only defined letter. This is possible because the parsing of the uh, string of the macros and the lookup of the names happens only when the user tries to use the grammar. If you are wondering how the boost metaparse string macro works, um, so it evaluates to something like this. The boost metaparse string uh, uh, with the string hello, uh, transform into the call to make string, with the length on the string, and the bunch of call to str at with a running index. str at takes a string and index and return either the character at that position or zero if we are past the length. So the first calls will return us the characters, and then we will have a bunch of zeros at the end. The make string function con uh, recursively concatenates the string until it reaches the end. So it effectively removes all the trailing zeros. The important thing to take away from this is not how the boost metaparse string works, but more the amount of effort and tricks that were necessary to create a compile time string in C++11. Now it's time to move to our second library, and also in time because this one uses C++17. Lexi is a, compi is a compiler uh, combinator library created by Jonathan Mueller. Uh, it has an expressive DSL for combining parsers, and it can compile at runtime or at compile time. And it can uh, parse at runtime or compile time. We can create a parser by defining a struct that has a rule and a value. Um, <coughs> a second. The rule defines how we process the input string, and the value defines how we uh, construct the parsing result. Lexi also has an online playground uh, to visualize and try parsers, and it is a useful uh, tool if you want to iterate quickly and debug your parsers. In terms of performance, Lexi is, uh, has a similar performance to other runtime parsers, as we can see in this uh, benchmark result that compares it to uh, other popular uh, JSON libraries. Here is what a typical uh, parser looks like in Lexi. So we have an outer uh, struct that has an inner parse function similar to the uh, uh, apply function in boost metaparse. But this time we also have this struct p in between that takes a next parser uh, template parameter. Inside the parse function we can invoke the next parser with additional argument. This design decision has the benefit uh, of solving the problem uh, of dealing with uh, different return types. 
Uh, so we don't need to return um, a variant or a tuple or an optional. Uh, we simply take the parsing result and, and pass it along in the call stack to the next parser. You can think of it as a push or shift operation where other parsers down the line can uh, pop or reduce the value. Another benefit of this design decision is that uh, it makes it easier to combine parsers. For example, the sequence uh, parser combinator is just an alias that rewires the next parser uh, template parameter. Now it's time to uh, move to the third library. So compile time regular expressions is a, um, a library for uh, using uh, red regular expressions in compile time. And it was created by uh, Hannah Dusikova. Um, we can create a regex uh, by, the, by passing the string, either as a non-type template parameter or by calling the CTRE uh, literal operator. The construction of the regex happens at compile time, so there is zero runtime overhead. And if you uh, provide an invalid pattern, you will get a compilation error. In terms of runtime performance, it is much faster than STD regex and has a similar performance to boost regex. Uh, the CTRE uh, uh, literal operator uses a helper class uh, fixed string that is just a wrapper around the fixed size array. Because a fixed string has a consexper operator, or a constructor, um, we can pass uh, the string we can uh, pass it as a non-type template parameter and have this expressive syntax. Look how much uh, easier it is compared to the uh, boost meta parse macro in C++11. Internally, CTRE uses an LL1 parser uh, that is implemented inside the library. The stack of a parser is implemented as a type list, which is, which is just an empty struct. And the performing operation on the stack is, is uh, done with the overloaded function. The grammar rules are also defined with uh, empty structs and overloaded functions for lookups. I think this is a very elegant solution that shows how such a, a complex system can be implemented from these two basic building blocks. Here is a uh, way, way oversimplification of the parsing loop of the LL1 parser. At each operation, we use the grammar to perform a lookup, and then we either return success or an error, or, uh, or recursively continue to the next iteration with the modified stack and input position. Uh, we talked about an LL1 library, now let's talk about an LR1. A CTPG, or Compile Time Parser Generator, um, is, uh, is written in C17 and created by Piotr Winter. We can use the library to generate an LR1 parser from a grammar. And we, it can also uh, generate lexical analyzer or use a costume one. In order to generate a parser, we first need to define all the terminals and non terminals. Uh, the library supports uh, uh, declaring uh, operator uh, precedence and associativity. It also supports uh, regular expressions. Uh, it has an internal uh, uh, regex parser that is generated by the LR1 uh, parser generator. We can uh, define the grammar rules in this uh, DSL uh, expressive syntax. And because all the non-terminals were, were already defined, we can have express, uh, recursive rules. A little bit about LR1 parser generator. Um, so in order to create the LR1 parsing table from a grammar, we need to find all the uh, sets that can be reached. And each uh, state is a set of items. In many runtime implementation, it is often represented by a set or an ordered set. How can we do it at compile time? Well, CTPG found a clever solution. It uh, uses some upper limit of all items that, are, that uh, can be of a maximum limit of uh, items, and then create a bit set in that size. It then uh, uh, has two functions to convert between an index in the bit set and an item. So this way, um, 
performing lookup, adding and removing items are just basic bit set operations. And it shows that some compile time problems can become a lot simpler if you can define some upper limit. Macro rules uh, is, uh, was created by uh, Maxim uh, Pasinchik. Um, and we can use this uh, library to uh, create uh, um, our own DSL with a, with a syntax similar to Rust's macro rules. Um, it is more of an experimental proof of concept than a full library. Uh, this is how you can use the library. So you uh, create a struct that inherits from a macro rules pattern. In this example, it is a list of parameters followed by an arrow and then an expression. Then you need to define a transform functions that uh, takes the result of matching our uh, input string and the pattern and transform it into some compile time value, which in this case is a lambda. Um, the, if you've seen in the previous slides, there were no string literals. This is because the library uses macro to convert uh, the text into a string literal. It abstracts the use of the literals and can help when using a syntax highlighting tools. Uh, another thing the, uh, this library does is that it hashes all the identifiers. It can be a lot simpler to pass around the fixed size hash than a variable size string. And also it can save perform a, a, a compile time. A, it, it can improve compile times. Now I have a question for you. What kind of string is used in every C++ application and must always be known at compile time? Anyone wants to guess? Yes, exactly. It's the source code. We must know it compile time because the compiler needs to compile it. Uh, which leads us uh, to, the, to our next uh, continuation of the topic with reflection. C++ has many introspection features, but we are still far away from having reflection as part of the language. Here are some libraries that uh, uh, give reflection uh, features that you can use right now. A common thing uh, that many reflection libraries do is that they use a macro to generate the reflection metadata. One way we can uh, use a um, compile time parser with reflection is to pass the source code. So in this, we, in this function, we have a, here we have a function that takes some source code, uh, parses some information about it, and returns it as a tuple. And we can use a macro to use the same text twice. One way, uh, first we uh, use it to call the reflect function. And then uh, and when, when we call the reflect, we uh, convert it to a string. And then we paste the string regularly so that it will be compiled by the compiler. But I think a more interesting direction is to use the reflection features uh, to enhance our uh, compile time parsers. And it will also show us how we can uh, uh, use uh, uh, the parsers. So let's assume we want to have syntax like this. We want to have a bunch of identifiers, parses uh, that uh, are separated by a dot, and convert it into a lambda that uh, returns a nested data member. I know this is not the most exciting syntax, but it will be a good example to show how we can work with compile time parsers and how they can integrate with reflection. So our identifier uh, parser matches an identifier and converts it, convert it into a hash value, similar to um, what macro rules does. And the, our path parser is just a bunch of identifiers separated by a dot literal. Um, because I wanted to experiment, I wrote my own uh, parsing library, but you can use any of the libraries we discussed before to do it. Um, we, are, we need some function to, uh, because our, our uh, parsers work with strings, we need some functions that can convert between an identifier and an actual value. So the resolve identifiers uh, has many overloads uh, that, con that takes some uh, compile time hash and returns a pointer to the data member. And we can use a similar trick to the other uh, reflection libraries to generate a, a overloaded function for each one of the data members of the struct. The uh, in literal operator takes the input string as a static string uh, and returns a lambda. 
the lambda first uh, parses the string at compile time and uh, returns and calls the get path function with the result of the parsing and the uh, input uh, argument. The get path uh, function is what does the heavy lifting. Um, it recursively iterates over the path. If we reach the end of the path, we return the current value. Otherwise, we get the current identifier, and then we use the identifier to get the data member of the current value and pass this data member to the next iteration. Um, here we have uh, from a compiler explorer. Let me see. Yeah. Um, so here we have two functions, one that uh, uses uh, the regular C++ uh, dot syntax and another that uses um, the costume uh, in a uh, parser and they both uh, create, generate exactly the same assembly. So this is a zero runtime overhead uh, abstraction. Let's extend our syntax a little bit and add two new operators. If we have the column operator, we will perform a range-based for loop. And if we have the pipe operator followed by a function, we will call this function with the value. Um, so the, we match the iterate operator matches the column uh, literal and returns an empty struct. And the pipe operator matches the pipe, uh, the pipe parser matches the pipe operator followed by an identifier and returns a, a pipe struct that wraps the identifier. Then our costume parser is just a combination of these two op, uh, parsers and our previous path parser. Now we need to extend our uh, implementation function. Instead of get path, we have costume path. And if we need to perform an iteration, we perform a range-based for loop. If we need to get path, then we can call the, if we have a path and we want to get a nested data member, then we can call the get path function, which we used before. And in the implementation of the pipe, um, we uh, get the identifier um, inside the pipe struct. And we um, use the scope lambda to get the actual functions that we need to call. The scope lambda maps an identifier to a value. And in most cases, it simply uh, calls the resolve identifier function. But we can also create our own local scope. And this way, we can expose local data members uh, to our uh, uh, parsers. Also, uh, we can use the local scope to uh, perform the lookup based on the current namespace that we are in. So let's compare the syntax of uh, our, let's compare our costume syntax to the regular C++ syntax. The new syntax that we created for this special purpose uh, is read from left to right. Um, the, the boilerplate of writing a range-based for loop is reduced to a single character. And we can nicely chain operators uh, or function calls with the pipe operator. And let's look at uh, the generated uh, assembly. And as you can see, um, we have F1 and F2. And they have the exactly same uh, instructions. So even after we complicated our parser, um, it is a zero overhead abstraction. Now we've seen how we can create a, a lambda from a syntax. Let's create a struct, a data type. And this is, in this example, we will create a struct, a, a very basic uh, a type. So um, we want to have this kind of syntax of uh, um, a name, column, and then some type kind of like in TypeScript. So we create a parser for it. Um, then we, need, we uh, define the struct member type, which holds a private data member and have an accessor functions, um, we, either with the resolve identifier mechanism or through the square brackets operator. We can combine uh, multiple uh, data members into the struct type by inheriting from them. In order to uh, convert our parsing result uh, into the actual struct, uh, we take every pair of identifier and, generate and uh, create a struct member for it. Then we pass the struct members 
into the combined members and get the final struct type. The result is we can write uh, structs like this. And also, uh, because all of the structs uh, already have the resolve identity of our function, they, they uh, can be used with our existing parser, or we can uh, use them in regular C++ code by using the square brackets operator. Um, I have compared the C++ syntax to uh, some special uh, purpose syntax, and I want to make this point uh, clear that um, the C++ syntax is amazing at what it does, which is uh, to be a general purpose language that is widely used across many fields and have many uh, different uh, uh, requirements. Um, the, the syntax of the C++ language can possibly fit every use case like a glove, and it doesn't need to, because it provides us with multiple uh, zero overhead abstractions that we can use to create our own expressive code. Compiled our parsers are just another one of these abstractions. Um, we've seen that uh, compiled time parsing is not something new. It was possible in uh, C++ uh, 11 or arguably C++ 98, um, and have continually improved since. The main limitations of this technique are compilation speed and context restrictions. And these often go hand in hand because the tricks that we uh, use to overcome the context restrictions are often what slows our compilation speed. Uh, we can uh, assume that in the future uh, it will continue to improve uh, through faster hardware, um, uh, compiler improvements, new language features, and discovery of new techniques. All of the languages in this photo can already be parsed during C++ uh, compiling, at least partially. Um, and in the end, we will reach a future when we can pass, pass every syntax and every language that you want, and they will all interact seamlessly through the compiler. It will be amazing until we will all be replaced by AI. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I, I hope this talk uh, sparked some interest in the world of uh, compiled time parsers. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them now or later. Yes. In term, in in runtime, no. It generates exactly the same assembly as if you wrote it uh, by hand. Yes. Yes. Um, so I haven't tried it with a very complex uh, syntaxes. Um, for the basic syntaxes, it, it is very, um, it is not noticeable. I think like from what I've seen, the main, uh, um, um, the main stalls come from if you have a lot of template instantiations or if you try to instantiate a huge uh, um, hierarchical uh, template. Um, which is a general program in C, a problem in C++ and not something specific to uh, compile time parsers. Um, in terms, many of the modern libraries, the uh, parsing code and the runtime code is almost identical. Um, and because the syntax is not as complex as the regular C++ syntax, um, I think um, you can get away with a lot of uh, simple uh, syntaxes and you will not feel uh, um, a lot of uh, compile time, like it wouldn't snow uh, your compile time that much. Uh, if, if you try to, to write like a, a big, like a complex parser, um, then it probably will. Um, any other question? Yes. What about your compile time, compile time errors? Do you have diagnostics? Um, in, uh, so, I think, uh, like the compiled, the, the, yeah. I'm talking about specifically in your DSL. If you make a mistake in your DSL. The kind of errors that you will get by the compiler. But can you control them? Can you print out the errors that you want? Um, I think like uh, some libraries already try to provide you, like I know um, with Lexi and I think also with uh, CTRE, um, but you can ask Hannah about it. Uh, uh, at least in Lexi, you, you, it gives you like the like 
kind of the best uh, that it can. Like you will still get the like the tons of line loss of uh, template instantiation error, um, but then in the end you will have a nice static cell that give you like more information. Yes. Yeah, I think I haven't. I, I'm guessing that yes, um, but I haven't tried it. I mean, you can write a concept um, that, uh, for example, that, that gives you, like, you know, oh, the, the concept that limits your syntax. So if you like use the wrong operator in the wrong context, um, you the the, con the concept will fail and you will get a, um, an error. I think it can improve it, but I haven't tested it. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much for listening.